So hopefully I am mic'd adequately enough that you can hear. Uh, I'm going to try to stay behind here. I have a habit of walking around. We're going to cover stuff that's sort of in between the things that Charlie Vanderhorst talked, talked about and then what Mike Cohen is going to talk about. And what I want to frame this with is talking about sex and sexuality. We'll then move and talk about STDs and really move beyond the concept of individual risk. And I think a lot of us are coming to the idea that although all sex is local, sort of, and we'll let you think about that, um, your risk of an STD is not really determined so much by your individual behavior anymore. Now granted, if you never have sex, then we can talk about what that means a little bit later on, your risk is going to be low. But I think sex is a lot like eating and sleeping and breathing. It's something that you will do, it's something that we all do, and it's part of being human. And if we all stopped having sex within one generation, humans would not exist anymore. So it's not a question of so much if, it's just a matter of when. So I want to put this into a framework around STIs and the real risk for adolescents and why that's the case. And then we'll move into talking about HIV and what we're seeing here in North Carolina for young black MSM and why those differences in terms of HIV risk are enormously high now for young men nationally as well as in North Carolina. And then we'll finish up talking about condoms. Short of a vaccine and never having any kind of sexual intercourse, using a condom with sex is probably the best thing you can do to reduce your risk for HIV and other STDs. Problem is they're not perfect, but I think condoms have gotten an awfully bad rap. So with that, we'll get started. Now, <clears throat> this is what sex looks like to me. Um, I'm a public health person, I think, in terms of networks and population level sex. And the point is uh, that when we think about risk, we say, well, this is this individual 63 here. It's a couple. This person gets an STD with a dark circle, this male. If this woman gets infected, that's the end of transmission if no other transmission or partnerships occur. So we would say that these folks are sexually dead. And what I mean by that is not that they die after they're having sex or that they never have sex again, but the transmission stops there. But if you were to take this male and put that male here and that male acquires an STD, then the risk for each one of these women is going to be much different. It'll be greater in terms of transmission and then we deal with downstream transmission. So it is about where you are in space, where you are when you're having sex, and more importantly, where you are in the networks. But these unions and network partnerships happen for all sorts of reasons. And so the question is, what is the meaning and the content of that black line? So we're going to start off talking about attractiveness, why people have sex, long-term, short-term relationships. I'm going to be using some slides from a friend of mine, Dennis Fortenberry. So the goals of sexual partnerships, well, frequently it's driven by just sexual attractiveness. Now, granted, there are people who have sex with folks they find repulsive, but I would gather to say most of you probably don't, especially if you haven't been drinking a lot. <laughs> sexual arousal and desire certainly plays a role, but it is different. But the problem we get into is I think a lot of us have thought that adolescents are somehow different than adults about how we view people and sex and goals. And the truth is, there ain't a whole lot of difference. The problem is we don't have good data looking at young adolescents. And by young, I'm talking about 15, 16 year olds. But we also have created a society in which we've extended adolescence up until 20s, 30s. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, but I know for a fact there's a few people in their 40s in the room who are students. And I'm not going to look over to that side of the room. Um, so the idea of what requires or what makes someone engage in sex is not all that much different, but yet the empowerment and the relationships are different. So we'll talk a little bit about sexual arousal and desires. So sexual strategy theory, there's all sorts of theories out there. Both men and women pursue, pursue short-term mating strategies when reproductive benefits outweigh risks. So when you stop and you think about this, this is sort of a risk-benefit assessment. Now, your ability to decide how much risk is there depends on all sorts of things. I've already mentioned alcohol. We talk about sex and drugs, but I think we forget about alcohol a lot of the time. That changes sort of the equation about risk perception. 
But we also know that without good education and without actually planning, that risk can be understated. And your risk is frequently thinking about where the person you're thinking about having sex is, who they are, what you know about them, but not all that network. So even though I think about sexual networks and where people are in that, I doubt very many of you stop before you engage in a sexual relationship with someone to think, I wonder where they are in this sexual network on campus. We don't ask for little chips to see all the people that they've had sex with over time and the folks that they've had sex with, yet the risk, as we'll talk about around HIV and other STDs, are very much tied to that. It's probably going to be obvious to many of the men in the room that men invest more in short-term mating strategies because of differential parental investment, and that is that men don't have a uterus. So um, men tend to think about as far as the end of their penis. <laughs> So when it comes down to mating strategies, it's frequently about the short-term gain without thinking about the long-term risk around pregnancy. And so it does change and shape what we do. The goal of living is to pass your DNA on. The question is, what's the best way of doing that? And unfortunately, as human beings, it's a lot more complicated than just DNA. Men and women have evolved different psychological mechanisms to solve adaptive problems of short and long-term mating strategies, and we'll spend just a little bit of time talking about that. So if we look at the relative importance of mate qualities by mating strategy and gender, it's not terribly surprising when we come back to attractiveness, and attractiveness playing a big role in short-term mating strategies. Now that's not particularly overwhelming, but again, we have to think about STDs in context of 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I doubt very many people in this room are thinking about long-term commitments while you're a student here at UNC. So yeah, you're not thinking about Friday night and who you meet and what party about, you know, all the other long-term sort of commitment things, status, creativity, kindness, liveliness. It still boils down to is there chemistry or is there not, and men and women aren't very much different when it comes down to short-term strategies, although men seem to be a lot more superficial than women if you look at the height of the bars here. So short-term, long-term partner selection strategies, adolescent sexual relationships as models. They serve as models for adult relationships. The social model is a long-term partnership, but the available partners are short-term. You're moving, you're changing. You know, when I talk to students, I ran an STD clinic for a decade in Wake County, and when we ask someone if they were in a long-term relationship, and you're in ninth grade, long-term boils down to about two or three months. Probably here, we're talking about a semester. I've been married for 15 years, so what is long-term versus short-term is very different. If I ask my nine-year-old what's a long-time thing, well, he's gonna think in terms of nine years. Three months is a long time for a nine-year-old. Three months for me, I, you know, I'm lucky I can remember three months back, but um, the commitments and relationships and the time sequence makes a difference. And of course, all of this boils down to experience, and then there are certainly developmental milestones. So when we talk about that, I'm really going to be reaching back to talk about 15 and 16 year olds in particular. So adolescents choose partners with something in mind. This isn't certainly a mindless activity. There really is this idea that there's certain things you're either looking for, you're exploring, or trying out. So again, features associated with attractiveness by mating strategy and gender. Body makes a difference. What someone's body looks like and whether you find it attractive. For short-term relationships, for both men and women, it makes a difference. But for men, it certainly pays a bigger role. You can see that for short-term relationships, I could have probably told you you didn't need to spend money for a research study to tell you that smiles and mouths matter a lot more to men and their female partners than it does for males. I mean, rather for females and their male partners than for men and their female partners. Height, we can go down the list of hair, face, and then non-physical attributes certainly seem to play a more important role in longer-term relationships. And we'll get this out of the way right off the bat. Men like to think that everything is determined by the length of their penis. And of course, you know, it depends what an inch is. Uh, and you never ask a man what six inches looks like, because you will not get the right answer. But <laughs> There is such a thing as too much of a good thing, so we'll get this out of the way right now. <laughs> Attractiveness goes down above about 120% of normal. So you can see here that, and of course we didn't define what normal is here, but I can cite, you can go back to the study and we can see what normal has been defined in that study. 
120% of normal seems to be about the max, and then attractiveness goes down. So too small? Eh, maybe not. And this is a flaccid penis. Too large? Definitely the case. But sexual desire is the engine of sexual networks. And so all those complex networks really are tied to what motivates us to have sex to begin with. And we can actually measure genital response. So uh, while you're sitting here, we actually have attract, attached electrodes to your seats, and we're seeing, and we'll show images coming up. <laughs> Not really, but there are ways of actually measuring general responses to see subjective and objective responses to sexual arousal. And there are similarities and differences in men and women. Males seem to be much more specific in what they find attractive, meaning gender, age of quote unquote object, which is not my term here. I would probably change that rather than referring to other people as objects. But for women, it really is non-specific, meaning that women will have a response to intercourse, whether it's male, 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 female, 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 animal having sex. And that sounds awfully bizarre, but it has a lot to do, we think, with reproductive wiring about nurturing and how we're put together. For men, what they subjectively find attractive seems to be very much tied to what they objectively respond to. So if it's same-sex gender males, they will find images of men having sex with men to be attractive. If they're men who are heterosexual and only find themselves attracted to women, watching two guys have sex isn't particularly appealing to those men. But for women, whether they find they're attracted to men or women, sexual intercourse in general, there's a response. Men can have habitual responses in terms of general responses, and of course, that's not terribly surprising when you look at mass advertising about what is considered sexual, which plays a big role with how we bring up images of sexuality at early ages. Now, I have a 11-year-old daughter, and I'm very much attuned to what she sees as being sort of the feminine image, and I'm hopefully not gonna offend Disney fans here, but we're not big Disney fans in our house because I don't want my daughter growing up thinking that you know she's a princess and that what is find attractive is that female princess image. But women tend to be less uh, attached to habituation or uh, what will be sort of drawn in that way from a sexual response. And then we know about Viagra. You can't turn on the TV during football season and not find about three different Viagra-type uh, commercials on TV with all sorts of euphemisms of guys throwing football through hoops, uh, waterfalls. It's amazing. There's all sorts of sexual images there. Some, some of them I'm not sure I even understand. But, um, but we haven't found pharmaceuticals to actually increase subjective arousal for women. And it's not so much that there's a pharmacologic difference locally at the genital tract probably has a lot to do with how women are wired to their genital responses. So I'm not here to say that men and women aren't sexual creatures and that we don't find something similar, but there are clearly differences that are there. The other aspect is that the arousal source makes a difference. So fear, exercise, erotica, meals, celebrations, parties, those of you that rave can tell you that that makes a difference too, and it's not just about what you do during the raves. And there's an interesting study that was done that sort of backs this up, looking at uh, a roller coaster ride and whether a person was on the ride with someone who they were romantically attached to or not. And they were shown pictures, neutral pictures of people that were considered to be attractive and then looking at their response. Did they find that person attractive or not? And it turns out that if you are riding, say, a ride by yourself or with a non-romantic partner, that whole stimulation of the ride and all that, they show you a picture, you get aroused, and you actually attach more to a visual image of someone who's attractive. Now, if you're riding that ride with someone who's romantic, that doesn't seem to be the case. So the venue and the environment in which things happen make a difference in terms of what you will find attractive in your bonding. Now, for those of us who trained in medicine, I can tell you that that happened a fair amount on call at night when bad things happened. You had this whole charge environment. You wonder why there's a lot of affairs that happen in residency, and I can tell you because you have these emotionally charged environments in which people sort of displace their arousal for what's going on as a sexual response. Um, and it's not just TV in which this happens. So in conclusion, 
Interpersonal mechanisms of STD transmission really does play a role. Sexual partnership formation is a sine qua non of STD among adolescents. It's essential. You're not going to get STDs unless you're having some sort of sexual contact. The reasons partners are chosen, the way partners are chosen, uh, and the operation of sex within partnerships likely dictate aspects of risk and protection. Adolescent partnerships contain all the elements that we see in adult relationships. They're just not as well described, and I think adolescents frequently aren't as empowered to make those choices. And I think we really have to come a long way of better understanding that if we're really going to tailor education so that we can reduce the risk. And the bottom line is the risk is real. So let's go back to partnerships in relationships. Again, we think about short-term partnerships. Partner A and partner B being in a sexual relationship, but there were previous partners and there are future partners that happen here. And the chain of transmission depends on all sorts of things if a person gets infected. Now we can do things at the network level, but those are really difficult to do. I mean, how do you disrupt networks. How do you have information to really know whether someone's having sex with someone else before? Can you rely on their history? Or what they're doing after they have sex with you, and as we'll talk about concurrency, if they come back and you engage in sex with that person again. We can do things that interrupt transmission between partnerships. Condoms are certainly one way of doing that. We're looking at vaginal microbicides, which I think you'll hear about later on that certainly work. For HIV, we're talking about oral medication that both men and women can take that may offer protection. Eventually, we hope to be looking at vaccine development for HIV, but we have STD vaccines right now. Hepatitis B, hepatitis A, HPV vaccines all reduce the risk of transmitting or acquiring STIs. So we can interrupt that transmission pattern that's there. And there's susceptibility modification, which also involves, again, vaccines or drugs on board. But all of it boils down to sex, and unless we're willing to talk about it, we're certainly not going to be able to really do anything about interrupting transmission. So we're going to come back to, again, that little black line and what contributes to all those differences that are there and the networks. Age. So if you take two things from the talk today, here, here are the two things. Uh, and I'll borrow this from Dennis Fortenberry. There are two ways to reduce your risk of acquiring or transmitting an STD short of not having sex and, of course, using condoms. One is to have sex with a peer. Now, that sounds really bizarre because I'm not encouraging you to have sex right now or as soon as you leave class. But what I mean is that that age difference between partnerships really does confer risk. <clears throat> Older individuals transmit STIs and HIV to younger individuals. And if we look at adolescents, if we look at male-male, male-female relationships, we see this routinely in looking at relationships that someone who is four or five years older, the risk of acquiring an STD from a person, if that person is older than you, is substantially higher than if you're having sex with someone who is your own age. And that's certainly not a foolproof strategy. So don't take it like, well, Dr. Leone said that if I have sex with someone else who's 20, I won't get an STD. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, believe it or not, if you're looking at someone who's 25 or 26 and you're 20 or 21, that risk goes up. The second is a no grazing policy. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. That means concurrency. So when I asked folks when I was taking sexual histories in the STD clinic about how many sexual partners they have, it's sort of like asking people if they smoke when they're in the hospital. What's the routine answer when I ask someone in the hospital if they smoke? Right. So what is the appropriate question to ask then about smoking if I'm asking someone in the hospital about smoking? When was the last time they smoked? Because usually what you would hear is, if, do you smoke? I'd hear a no. And if I said, what was the last time you smoked? It's usually the day they came into the hospital. So it's sort of, why don't, that doesn't really count. So when we ask about sexual partnerships, you ask so many people how many partners they have, usually people don't tell you 50. They'll tell you one. So you have to put it into a time frame over what period of time, in the last month, the last two months, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Race, ethnicity, and immigration status. Unfortunately, although transmission during sex is similar, whether you're someone who's black, white, Hispanic, Latino, your risk is different depending on your race and ethnicity because this society is as bound with all the racial barriers that are there around economics, access to health care, as it is with STDs. 
So as we'll talk as we go through STD data, the risk for certain groups is much higher for the same number of sexual partners as it is for someone or in a different group. And that's important because our strategies around risk reduction have been frequently based on the idea that you control your own destiny, and that if you reduce the number of partners you have, you won't get an STD or HIV. And that is no longer the case for black MSM in the United States, unless they absolutely have no sex. Socioeconomic status. Poverty and lower socioeconomic status is associated with higher risk. If you control for all other factors, that still comes out. And so, again, we talk about disparities, inequities, and inequalities. It exists in our society. Unless we deal with these contextual issues, we're not going to deal with that. Religion, not so much in terms of your risk of acquiring an STD, but discussion around sex and sexuality. In a society in which we say we like to have people in stable relationships, if we're not about equal rights and supporting folks in stable relationships, and I'm going to tell you right now what my bias is around same gender unions, we should be getting out of the way and trying to support people to be coupled in relationships for all sorts of reasons. We're not going to be able to actually reduce transmission of STDs and HIV because we do everything we possibly can as a society to undermine that. So gender equality is important and religion comes into that discussion. That doesn't mean that you, know, you can, can or can't have your own belief system, but I wish we lived in a society in which we said, look, I'm gonna believe what I wanna believe, but I sh should support you in being healthy and doing all that I can, no matter what my beliefs are, for you to stay healthy and be healthy as an individual. And we can come back to that in discussion because I'm sure that'll be a controversial point for some folks here. Where you live certainly plays a role. Reputation, maybe not so much. So let's segue then talking about STDs and sexual intercourse in the US. <clears throat> so there have been some good things that have happened. The rate of starting first sexual intercourse has declined. If we look at this, and this was just published back in 2008, but we have more recent data from 1995 to 1996. You can see here the early first intercourse mean age was 14. The normative age of first intercourse was 17. Late first intercourse, meaning the last 25% by the age that they first engaged in sexual intercourse, was 22. So in 1996, 95, when the survey was done, the mean age for first sexual intercourse was about 18 years of age, but about 25% of folks engaged in sexual intercourse at around 14. So we're dealing with a fairly high difference here. But if you look, you can see differences based on gender, race and ethnicity, and education level. However, if we look at what's happened now over the last couple of years, we've actually seen a decline in the number of people engaging in sex. Of course, this is looking at cumulative time uh, in terms of first intercourse. So by the time we're looking at 18 years of age here, and this again was back in 2009, you can see that we have differences based on race and gender of the percentage of folks who have not engaged in sexual intercourse. So if we look at this line here for African American males, about 70% of African American males by the age of 18 in this one survey had engaged in sexual intercourse. If we go to Asian males, again, you're looking at around 60%. So the majority of folks overall have engaged in sexual intercourse by 18, but we're looking at differences. Now these differences are not good or bad, and certainly don't mean to imply that you as an individual, if you're a white male, you can go to this line and say, well, I fit in here, I don't fit in here. These are not predictive about what you as an individual will do, but looking at overall what happens. We have to deal with the normative behavior overall because if we're not having discussions in high school, if we're not having STI screening available to kids and condoms in high school, and there are very few high schools that provide condoms, then we're actually having folks who are engaging in sexual intercourse without good information, without protection. However, we've seen a decline. So our messages around HIV, I think, have hit home in the last few years. It's not great, but we're seeing a decline in terms of the percentage of married, never married males and females, 15 to 19 years of age, who've engaged in sexual intercourse. We went from 51%, and this is back in 1988, to 43% in 2006 to 2010. And you see this is a rather dramatic change in men from around 60% 
to 42 percent. That means now the majority of folks 15 to 19 years of age have not engaged in sexual intercourse, both male and women. Now, when is the right age to have sexual intercourse? I can't tell you. So uh, when I was at Wake County, we had uh, one day that they brought in eight and nine-year-old boys into the STD clinic, and we would have this discussion. So I asked all of them how old uh, they had to be to drive, and they all knew what age. I mean, you know, it was like, well, you have to be 16 or 17. They weren't off like you have to be 50. Um, then I asked them how many of them had a car, and they all thought that was pretty silly because they're all nine. So none of them raised their hand for that. So then I asked them how old they had to be in order to have sexual intercourse, and I got the 35, you know, 50. It's, which, you know, I thought that was cute, but I wasn't going to say, well, we'll just wait. Um, <laughs> but then I asked them how many of them had a penis, and they thought that was really funny. Um, but no one raised their hand initially, and then they realized, like, well, I'm not going to be. So, like, one kid put up his hand, and, like, within 30 seconds, everybody in the room had their hand up because not one of these boys wanted to be the only guy in the room not putting his hand up that he had a penis. Um, I'm just checking myself right now as I talk. No. Uh, so, uh, but I asked them, I said, well, then, you know how old you have to be to have to drive, and yet none of you own a car, but you all know that you're going to drive eventually. But you all have a penis, and yet we can't seem to agree on what age it is that you're going to have sexual intercourse. And I said, I can't tell you. All right, but I think you need to be prepared for that when it happens. The point is you have to have that discussion early. And if we just stop with saying don't have sex, we're not preparing people for what happens next. So although I'm encouraged that these numbers have come down, we still have very high rates of STDs among adolescents. And so this is an important thing about delaying sexual debut. But as I've said, that's not a long-term strategy. So it's sort of like saying that you won't, you know, you won't catch a cold if you don't inhale. Well, that's great, right? That's a wonderful strategy. I just will hold my breath whenever I'm around people. That's only going to last for a very short period of time, right? Now, if we look at the use of contraception at first intercourse, again, you can see that we've had some gains here, which is encouraging. Use of, of contraception at last intercourse, um, we see differences here, again, much higher than what we were back in 2002, 97, 92 percent. Now, personally, I think asking people about how often they use condoms is not particularly useful. So we take a history, ask them the last time they had sex, did they or did they not use a condom? Most people tend to remember the last time they had sex, um, but if you're asking people to give you an aggregate number, it's all over the map, so we don't. So when you read studies, it's really important to, to be skeptical about condom use history and studies and stick with something like this that says the last intercourse. That's the reason why we do this in terms of asking folks. Now this is a really busy slide and I apologize for that. I put this in here because remember I talked about abstaining. The reasons for never having sex in 15 to 19 year old males and females, 2000 to 2006 and 10, if you read through this you can see, remember we talked about religion in that slide that was there? The reasons for having, not having sex in the year of interview, you can see about 48 percent, and it varies based on race and ethnicity, refer to it's against their religion or morals. Um, and the reasons that uh, they didn't have sex, if you look here in terms of males, again, about a third overall. Talk about religion and morals. So it's important, but that's not going to be sustaining in the long run if they decide to have sex. So that's where we're going to move onward. Report ever having sexual intercourse. You can see the differences here across the board. It actually worked in terms of seeing decline. We have differences in terms of race and ethnicity, but overall trend is downward. And the use of condoms for all races and ethnicities looked at here, black, white, Hispanic, that of course doesn't include all racial and ethnic groups, has gone up. Again, very busy slide. I'm just going to cut to the last part here. Um, if we look at a survey looking at uh, behavior and risk, risky activities, so were they heavy drinkers, binge drinkers, et cetera, and then whether they reported ever having an STD, 
Black females generally were the least likely to be in a high-risk behavior cluster, but the most likely to report having an STD. We'll come back to this because when we start looking at the racial and ethnic differences in this country and we see this big divide around HIV and STDs based on race and ethnicity, I'm here to tell you that it's not about individual behavior. The assumption is, well, that someone is really promiscuous who got an STD. That's not the case. And the differences that we see in race and ethnicity in this country, with the high rates among minorities in particular, have to do with social structures that are in place and all the barriers that contribute to discrimination, poverty, lack of access to all sorts of things in our society. And our message about individual behavior really begins to break down if we're not addressing these larger social factors. So what are the STD burdens for adolescents? Adolescents account for about 25% of sexually active individuals in a society, yet they account for about 9 million STD infections and about 50% of all new STDs. So we do see a disproportionate number of STDs in young adults, 15 to 24 year olds. If we break it down further by STDs, about 74% of all of our HPV infections occur in individuals under the age of 25. About half of our new HIV infections, about 60% of our gonorrhea infections, over half of our chlamydia infections, and for herpes, it's about 50%. Now, we just published a study last week, and we'll come back to herpes in a second, that when we talk about herpes, I'm talking about HSV-1 and HSV-2. So it used to be that we would only talk about general HSV-2 for genital infections. In a study we just published last week in the New England Journal, we followed young women prospectively. 60% of the new genital infections due to herpes were due to HSV-1, and yet there were no differences in behavior that we could pick up for those that acquired HSV-1 generally versus those that did not acquire herpes at all. So the risk goes beyond individual behavior. It depends where you are in the network. It's facilitated by other ST, STIs and mixing patterns and concurrency. So let's go through some of the data. <clears throat> there is a National Health and Nutrition Survey. This is a population-based data looking at 14 to 19-year-old females, and they screened them for sexually transmitted infections. And they looked at the four most common STIs. Chlamydia, HSV2, HPV, and trichomonas. So they looked at did they have any or all of these different STIs. <clears throat> they did have gonorrhea in here, but the numbers were pretty small. And what they found was still striking to me even all these years later. And that is if you looked overall across the board, 25% of the adolescents had a sexually transmitted infection, either HPV, chlamydia, trichomonas, or HSV2. So one in four adolescent females had a sexually transmitted infection. If we broke that down based on race and ethnicity, it was about 50% of non-Hispanic black adolescents had an STI. Now here we go, right? You say, well, how could someone who does not have a sexual partner how could there be a 7.5% prevalence for an STI? Remember Bill Clinton? He's still around, and I love that guy. He's a great man, as flawed as he is. But he said, well, it all depends during the Monica Lewinsky trial about what is is. Well, is is a big word. And <clears throat> sex, as defined by vaginal intercourse, uh, is not, in my mind, the beginning and ending of all sexual encounters. So, we can see STI transmission, and this is sort of a sidebar. I got a phone call last week from a woman in Kuwait who uh, read a blog that I did for the New York Times, and she said, well, I'm in my 30s, you know, I'm Muslim, it's a very conservative country, I'm not married, I started seeing this guy, and I'm still a virgin, but I was diagnosed as having herpes. And, I, you know, and I've learned over time not to challenge people like, okay, so how did you get herpes if you're still a virgin? So, you know, and it turns out that she was engaging in anal intercourse with this male so she could maintain her quote unquote virginity. Well, her risk of all sorts of things, including HIV, is gonna be a lot higher by having anal intercourse and vaginal intercourse. So again, what the definition of virginity and sex is makes a difference, and in this case, you can see 
zero number of lifetime partners, about a 7.5% prevalence for STIs, but it doesn't take a lot of partners for that risk to go up. So if you're looking at one or two number of lifetime partners, you're still looking at a 20 to 40% risk. So yes, I know it's making people twitchy. No, you're not acquiring STIs by sitting in this classroom while we're speaking. Yes, I know three is not a whole lot of partners. You ask people, well, what's considered a large number of lifetime partners? Um, and usually, at the end of the day, if you really push people, it's someone who has more partners than they've had over the course of their lifetime. But the numbers are pretty small here. If you say or a strategy is zero lifetime partners, you don't allow much of a margin of error for acquisition of STIs because in this group of, this is again, population-based survey, one lifetime partner, 20% prevalence of STIs. So if our goal is delaying sexual debut, that's great. But reducing number of partners lower than one over the course of a lifetime ain't great, especially if you're an adolescent. So we have to deal with the risk that's there, and it's significant. It's significant even on our college campuses in North Carolina. So this is a study we did in 2007. It's a convenient sample, so I'm not, and I did not list what the schools A, B, C, and D were because people are gonna go, well, hell, I'm not having sex with anyone on campus number D because they have, you know, um, my point is, we did a convenience sample. We, we had men and women on campus pee in a cup, and we screened them for gonorrhea and chlamydia. So these were asymptomatic individuals, and you can see that the prevalence rates for chlamydia were enormously high. Seven and a half, you can see on one campus is 20%. If you look for GC, I know there's some zeros in there. The numbers are small, but overall, this is considered really high. One or two percent prevalence for gonorrhea is considered enormously high. <clears throat> if you broke this down by gender, high rates, if we looked at distribution by positivity in terms of race and ethnicity, yes, we saw differences that were here. Again, we're going to come back to this difference in race and ethnicity because it, although the rates are much higher, and this is not looking at 94% of African Americans have STIs, this is saying that for the STIs that we found on these campuses, 94, 95% were occurring in African Americans. The disparities that are there have to do with all sorts of things, and it's not based on number of partners. So why do we see STIs in adolescents? I'm not going to read this whole laundry list. There are biological reasons for susceptibility in young women that put them at higher risk for acquisition of things like chlamydia and gonorrhea. Utilization of health care. How many guys in this room go in for an annual physical exam? Some do. How many women go in for some sort of annual routine examination? Right, we got a lot more hands. Now, why is that? Remember we talked about strategy and what the long-term, short-term goals around reproduction? I can promise you probably most of you are going either for contraception reasons or pap smears. So we have this sort of natural thing about women going in and seeing clinicians. Guys, first of all, aren't interested in showing their junk to some person they don't know, you know, some 50-year-old guy in the clinic, forget it. They're not going to drop trow and cough. <clears throat> I know, we're not very brave. Uh, but the idea that guys who don't have symptoms should go in for routine STI examinations also doesn't ring true. In fact, how much do we have in North Carolina, either state or federal dollars, coming in to provide STI screening for chlamydia for asymptomatic men. Zero. Zero dollars. Does that make any sense? Now, we do see women transmit STIs to women. So same gender couples, we see HPV, HSV1, trichomonas transmitted. But most STIs are transmitted by men, either to women or to other men. And yet, our strategy around STI control, especially for adolescents, is we screen women. Men don't access health care. Men don't routinely go in. And we've made it difficult for men to do that because we say, well, they got to go in, they got to show us their junk, whatever. So we're coming up with strategies in which we can come up with leverage for the technology where people can pee in the cups, never see a clinician, be screened, call and get the results, or get it online. The idea that you have to make an appointment and show up to get checked for something that you don't think you have not likely to get you motivated to do it. And we've already talked about some of the population level risks we'll come back to in lifestyle choices. So sexual risk behaviors include becoming sexually active in the teen years, having more than one partner, partner characteristics, concurrency, having sex with someone who has an STD, 
85% of STIs, sexually transmitted infections, are asymptomatic. So merely asking someone if they have symptoms or doing a quote unquote visual exam, not a bad idea, but you know, unless you're gonna be in there with a flashlight uh, and a miner's hat, you're probably not gonna be able to come up with much. And even then you're still gonna miss a lot of STIs, in fact, the majority of them. And condoms, they're only good if you use them. So the mere fact that you have a condom in your wallet, guys, does not offer protection for you acquiring an STD. If it sits on the counter while your penis is in the vagina or rectum or mouth, great. That's great. I'm glad you brought, we'll give you a point for bringing the condom to the dance, but if the condom is not dancing with you, it ain't offering you protection. So what is the prevalence that we're talking about here? For chlamydia, we're looking at about 12.5% prevalence for adolescents, for African Americans, about 5 to 6% for Latinos, and about 2% for whites. This is population-based data, the Adolescent Health Survey. There are differences. Well, let's look at gonorrhea. We find the same sorts of differences here with much higher rates for African Americans. Let's stratify who has an STD and who doesn't based on risk categories. I'm not going to read all of these categories to you. This is looking at wh whites. Red clusters are higher rates of, of STIs. These are higher risk groups, either because of the behavior or because of the type of sex that they engage in. Now, keep this in mind. This is for whites, and the numbers are going to change here as well. This is what we see for African Americans. So let's go back. Whites, low risk behavior, low prevalence of STIs. For blacks, doesn't matter what the behavior is, the rate of STI is really not a whole lot different. In fact, if we look at comparing the three largest clusters, you can see that the rates are higher and we're looking at low risk behavior. So what's the conclusion we can take from this? African American young adults are at a very high risk for STIs even when their behavior is what we call normative, meaning it's not high risk by anybody's definition. Whites are only at elevated risk when their behavior is very risky. And I'm not putting a moral judgment on any of these behaviors, all right? We're just talking about risk in terms of the type of sexual intercourse. Even when you control for socioeconomic status, condom use, marriage, and age of first intercourse, they don't account for the racial disparities that we see that exist. So it comes back to, Yes, I know, Kevin Bacon rears his ugly head once again. Where you are in the network and the structure of that network. So what are the explanations for these differences? Well, this, what is the single greatest risk for acquiring an STI? It has to do with the partnerships. We sort partners by race and ethnicity for the large part. So if you look at where we sit, the fraternities or sororities we belong to, where we live, we are very, very structured into breaking us into small groups. And as much as we think we're a heterogeneous society, we don't live that way. And our sexual partnerships are small. So we had a college outbreak in North Carolina for HIV. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. But we calculated the number of black men between the ages of 18 and 30 who were men who had sex with men for the entire triangle. So Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. Anyone want to venture the guess the number of black MSM between the ages of 18 and 30 that we calculated based on population data for the whole triangle? Numbers, anybody? Who says more than 100,000? They might not know what MSM is. Oh, men who have sex with men. Turns out 2,000 total. So if you're a black male who's interested in having sex with other men, one, we tend to have sex with people that are either like us by race and ethnicity because that's what our society does. Again, I, I don't think that that's a good thing, but it's the way things are for us. 2,000 individuals, your risk of coming in contact with an STI is going to be a lot greater just because of the small number than if you're a white heterosexual male. So how many students are on the North Carolina UNC campus? But 29,000. And I think over half of them are women. 
right? So heterosexual males, not too bad. You have more choices of partners on the UNC campus than a black MSM has for the whole triangle. So same risk if an STI enters into that network, your risk of coming in contact if it's a small pool with big fish is a lot greater than if you're swimming in an ocean with small fish, right? My point is that the networks make a difference. In addition, if your choices are small, the mixing pattern that's there puts you at higher risk, meaning you have smaller choices, your risk or, or your probability coming into someone who has high risk activity is much greater than if you've got a larger pool to choose from. So what we say around distortive mixing means your chance of coming in contact with someone who has multiple partners, who has other STIs, is much greater in a small network, and we see more of that for groups that are marginalized in our society than the majority population. And this is an example of a syphilis HIV network out of Fayetteville. And the legend here is that the red circles uh, and a red circle, or salt red circle are folks that have HIV. The orange, um, these are prevalent HIV, so this is more acute. The dark blue are syphilis, and the pink here is either purple is either not tested and the green's negative. So this person was diagnosed with having both syphilis and HIV. We interviewed, we asked him about his partners and we interviewed them. What is the probability that one individual would come into contact with one, two, three, four, five people with HIV? I mean, think about it. And I, I can tell you, we see this over and over again. We have 20-year-old, 21-year-old guys being diagnosed with HIV. We look at their sexual networks, and the prevalence for HIV is 30, 40, in one case, 60, 70 percent. It's not random chance. It's not like they're asking people, like, hey, do you have HIV? If you don't, I don't want to have sex with you. They think they're having sex with people who don't have HIV. These folks don't necessarily know their status, and yet the probability to come in contact is much higher. So you're looking at a person who might have one partner over here that they named, they named five, well, let's just pick one of these individuals here. They're coming into contact who's one person removed from a very complex network with lots of HIV and syphilis. So it's not terribly surprising if this person says, well, they only had one partner and it was this person, their risk of STI or requiring HIV is going to be much higher than remember those networks in which we only looked at two people in the dyad and that's it? In addition, other STDs play a role in transmission or acquisition of HIV in particular. So we know both ulcerative and non-ulcerative STDs play a role in that. This is a complex slide just looking at herpes. I'm not going to go through all of it, but there's lots of reasons for it. It's there with all the references you could possibly want. But it's not just about causing inflammation. We know we have upregulation of inflammatory cells at the mucosal surface. Even for asymptomatic STIs, increases your risk if you're exposed to HIV and then coming into contact with HIV. I don't know what happened there. My screen just went out, but I'll look up here. If you have an STD and HIV, you increase the amount of HIV in your genital secretion. So when we see duly infected individuals, they increase the probability of transmitting HIV to other partners. And every time they acquire an STD or have an outbreak, they're more likely to transmit HIV as well as that STD. So let's go back and look at herpes in particular and look at the number of partners and prevalence rates. And you can see we see differences here based on race and ethnicity. And if we take that and say, what's the population attributable risk for acquiring HIV? It turns out that in the US, for men who have sex with men, about 35% of our HIV infections that we see, new HIV every year, we can attribute to that person having herpes first, genital herpes. For African Americans, it's about 35%. Overall in the US, it's about 20%. So STIs play a role in increasing that risk, and we see higher rates of STIs, even controlling for behavior in racial and ethnic minorities and in MSM, largely because of the network that people are in. Remember I talked about partnerships and concurrency. And concurrency is referring to the number of partners you have in time and overlapping sexual partnerships. 
So <clears throat> a lot of Americans practice what I call serial monogamy, meaning they, have, they meet someone, they engage in sexual intercourse, they have sex with that person, that relationship ends, and they don't go back to that person again to have sex. Concurrency, though, increases the risk of transmission within a sexual network. So we talk about no grazing policy. We mean that you only have sex with someone that you're seeing, and when that relationship's end, you don't go back and have sex with that person again while you're still engaging in a relationship with someone else. So a concurrent relationship is this person here. They meet partner G, they have sex with partner G, month one, month two, they meet partner H, they've ended this relationship, they have sex with partner H. Month five, they go back to partner G, month six, they go back to H, and the risk of transmission at partner G has an STI, partner H now has a risk of acquiring it because of the way the relationship works. So concurrent sexual partnerships are things that overlap in time, they permit more rapid spread. Even though they don't increase the risk for that individual, they have an impact on the network. So what sorts of things then would contribute to concurrency in our society? Can you think of anything? I can tell you a couple. For older adults in the US, prison. We incarcerate more men of minority status in this country than are in our colleges. If you remove men from the society, you're destabilizing relationships, and when those men come back out, they frequently go back to the relationships they had before. So that contributes to concurrency. Not sort of providing support for same gender unions, meaning we encourage the breakup and instability of relationships. Discrimination and marginalization of MSM in general. I can't tell you the number of men who I interview who meet partners over the internet because they actually don't want to disclose to anybody in their immediate environment that they have sex with same gender individuals. So as a result, it's very hard to form permanent long-term relationships because you can't, because you're afraid about being outed in your own community. So these networks play a role and I'll show you how it contributes to transmission. So this is looking at a simulation of relationships, and you can see lots of dyads and dots here. And you can see the separation here, black and white with a little bit of overlap. But when you look at concurrent modeling and you tweak that just a little bit to actually move concurrency, you can see how complex the networks become and the interconnectedness. So let's go through a model simulation. And we're going to talk about one, two, or three partners distribution. So we're not talking about someone who has 50 partners here. We're talking about one, two, or three time lifetime partners and overlapping in time of those partnerships. And just a subtle shift from going from one to two, and you can see going here to more three, you can see that those networks go from this structure to something that looks a lot like snot. So Small changes in the network in terms of overlapping relationships play a big role in interconnectedness and the risk of transmitting STDs through that network. So let's come back again and look at incidents uh, in the US. And for some reason, again, this thing is out up here, so I'm, pardon me for having to look at the screens here, but so if we look at incidents in the US, this is recent data, and you can look at the number of new infections. Now, there's real issues with looking at these numbers around confidence intervals, but this is looking at uh, number of new cases per 100,000 in the U.S., and you can see maybe a tick up here for men overall came down for women going from 2006 to 2009. But here's what happened for young men, young men who have sex with men the incidence rate actually rose. It's the only group in which you saw a rising number of new infections in the U.S. So overall, the number of new infections in the United States has been right around 50,000 new cases a year. But if you dig down below those numbers, the number for young men ages 13 to 29 years of age has gone up, and that biggest increase has been among young black men. You can see the numbers going up. This is the North Carolina-specific data. It's a little hard to explain this blip uh, 
in 2007. I think it's an artifact, but relatively speaking, it looks like maybe our numbers are flat, might be going down compared to the U.S. incidence data, which is relatively flat. But I put this up here to show you something that I think is still striking. Remember we talked about new infections in young adults. If you look at the estimated 2009 incidence data, number of people infected in 2009, and we broke it down by age, about half of all of our new HIV infections occurred in individuals under the age of 30 in 2009. That trend has continued in North Carolina in 2010 and 2011. We have a program here that we run out of UNC for the state of North Carolina looking at what we call acute HIV, the very earliest stages of HIV. We can identify folks within about the first eight weeks of infection. Our median age around eight years ago, meaning what was the sort of age overall for the number of acute infections that we identified was right around 31. The last two or three years, the median age has dropped down to around 21 years of age in North Carolina. So we're seeing here a real risk for young men around HIV. And that risk is, as I've mentioned, primarily for men who have sex with men, although we still see uh, women who acquire HIV. Um, and this is heterosexual acquisition. I think it's easy to forget, but about a third of all HIV in North Carolina is heterosexually acquired. Remember we talked about the role of STDs in HIV acquisition and transmission. There's a disproportionate impact, and those STDs set the stage for acquisition of HIV. So if we look nationally around STIs, HIV infection overall was about 53% occurred in MSM. Syphilis, 65% of all of our new syphilis cases in the United States occurred in men who had sex with men. About 20% of our gonorrhea we estimate that way. And very high rates of co-infection. <clears throat> Mississippi about three years ago had an outbreak in young men that very much mirrored what we saw in North Carolina in our colleges. We described an outbreak of HIV in college campuses about eight years ago. And what they found in looking at phylogenetic clusters when they look at the virus and they can see whether or not what was transmitted was the same virus from person to person. And when they looked at young black MSM, what they found was that Transmission was occurring by young black men having sex with other young black men. But the geographic area was rather diverse. Ruralness, being in the South, and all the barriers that exist for identifying as being gay in the South contribute to folks hooking up and meeting across broad geographic areas. Again, if your choice is 2,000 partners in the whole triangle, you might want to drive around or find ways of meeting people. Well, that then facilitates, again, transmission that jumps geographic areas, and that's what they saw in Mississippi. But what I think is really powerful is what they said at the end here was that they thought that the way to reduce HIV transmission among young MSM may require prevention strategies that are tailored to young black men. So the CDC this year will be launching an initiative for young black men. And notice it didn't say young black MSM, young black men. <clears throat> 15 and 16 year olds aren't necessarily so willing to identify as being gay or bisexual. And yet the risk is real, and it's real at a very early age for HIV acquisition. So if we're really gonna be able to do something, we have to talk about sex and sexuality that doesn't require people to pigeonhole or define themselves into being any one particular group but we still have to deal with the structures that are there underneath it that drive it. And why that's important, I think, is pretty well illustrate, illustrated here. So this is looking at a sexual network. Remember I said that I think about sex in terms of networks, and I do. So this is a network map of HIV in North Carolina, and it's pretty amazing when you look at it. But you notice here the red squares are acute HIV that we identified. The blue are folks that are meaning that we're chronically infected. They may have been infected for one, four, five, six years. <clears throat> but how did they meet? They met online. So remember I talked about how in Mississippi they found this jump across geographic areas. Why would people go online to meet other partners? It's a way of finding people. It certainly adds efficiency. Our experience is that because they, they 
there is no other way for them to meet people. If you live in a small town in North Carolina, it may not be acceptable to your family, to your church, or the people in your town that you're gay. So you are forced to sort of meet people online. You're worried about being outed. And so you don't want to be found. You don't want to be contacted. So what we're seeing is a lot of anonymous sex. It's not that the internet in and of itself is risky. It's just that I think we've created a, a structure in which we're not facilitating people to engage in safer behavior because they can't. Now you could say, well, gee, their options are to not have sex. But you see lots of commercials on TV, right, for uh, what are some of the internet sites that people, uh, eHarmony or some of these other things. <clears throat> How many of you have seen actually commercial on TV for same gender partners? I've seen commercials on TV for meeting Christian partners over the internet. But we don't see that. Why? Because people are terrified. I mean, you, first of all, you probably would get groups protesting that there's airtime given to, you know, a group that's advertising meeting same gender partners. So think about it. We really don't live in a society in which we say it's okay and we encourage people to have to be safer. And again, we can have time. We will have time to debate some of this a little bit more, but this is really worrisome to me. And it means that ending the epidemic, and Mike Cohen We'll talk to you about his study, HPTN 052, in which they found that treatment reduces the risk of acquiring or transmitting HIV by 96%. You can't offer treatment if you don't know who's infected, if you don't know who they are and they don't know their status. That's a problem. So my concern, again, is we have to start at a young age, dealing with these things and dealing with all the structural and cultural factors that are there. And again, you can see what these networks look like in North Carolina. So we're going to finish up here in the next five to ten minutes on condoms. The question is whether to sheath or not to sheath. And I will not tell you that condoms mean that you can have safe sex. It's really safer sex. There is no such thing as safe sex. By definition, in my mind, sex is not safe. So it's sort of like saying drive safely. Uh, yeah, I want you to drive safely, but anytime you get in the car, there's always a risk. Of, even though you're doing all the right things, someone else may cross the center line and plow into you. So we want you to be prepared and do all the things that you want to be to be safe, and I think condoms certainly work. Secondly, our most effective strategies to prevent pregnancy are not our most effective strategies to prevent STIs, and our most effective strategies to prevent STIs are not our most effective ways of preventing pregnancy. So if you're looking at hormonal contraception or IUDs, that's a great way of making sure you don't get pregnant, but offers you no protection about acquiring an STI, and in fact, Hormonal contraception may increase your risk of acquiring some sexually transmitted infections. And then the other part is abstinence versus abstinence only. I'm all for abstinence. I just don't understand why we have to have only attached to it for life. So <clears throat> when you're reading about condoms, you have to talk about efficacy versus effectiveness. And it's key to think about these terminology because efficacy talks about protection under ideal conditions and it depends on the, on the device itself. What are the properties of the device? When really what we're talking about with condom use and protecting you is effectiveness. Protection under actual conditions depends on you and the device and how you use them. So we can have the best device in the whole world to offer protection, but if you're not putting the condom on properly or storing them properly or using them consistently, you're gonna get infected. Now, the argument I hear all the time is that, well, condoms break and they don't offer protection and blah, 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 blah. I love this slide because it says that <clears throat> just putting it on before you have sex, even if the condom breaks, offers you substantial protection. So I'm not advocating that you buy defective condoms as a cheap way of actually getting condoms into your place. But... <clears throat> This idea that condoms don't work all the time sort of ignores the reality of covering an area and protection. So if no condom is used, or condom is used, there's no break, no leak, we say that there's zero transmission of fluid. What's a condom? It's a semen catcher. I mean, that's what it does. It collects semen and all the pathogens that are there. The reason why condoms don't work great for things like HPV and herpes, even though they work somewhat well, is that those are diseases or infections that are transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact. So <clears throat> if you fail to use the condom at all, the average ejaculate, here's one you could 
a little bit in your memory. What is the average volume of an ejaculate? It's 3.3 mils. So next time on Jeopardy, you can say for $500, I guess the average ejaculate size is 3.3. Um, anyone familiar with the group 10cc? So does anyone know where, that, where they got their title from? They weren't interested in the average. They were looking at the maximum male ejaculate for semen. So that's where they got the name. You'll probably never listen to their music again after that. Um, but if you use the condom, but it breaks, there's some exposure. But look at how low the risk here. It's not, in terms of relative risk, it's not a tenth, it's a hundred. It's six one thousandths compared to not using it all. It breaks, but there's no, there's, there's no visible, but there's a visibly detected hole, but no break. You can look how low that is. There's a, a hole in it, right? You can look at this. It's remarkable. So the idea that, well, there's holes in condoms, they don't work, doesn't match up for what we know the real exposure is. And better to use them sometimes than not at all. So it's sort of like telling someone either you smoke or you don't smoke. Yeah, I'd rather you don't smoke, but if you're going to smoke, I'm going to try to get you to reduce the, t the amount of cigarettes that you use. I'd like for you to use condoms if you're having sex to protect yourself. You're better off using them some of the time as opposed to none of the time. And even if they break, they offer protection. And do they work? They work for all the diseases that are listed here. And in particular for HPV, which is the banner poster child about, you know, condoms don't work. We found that actually using condoms about 50% of the time offered a significant protection in reducing the risk of HIV. So using condoms 50% or more had a 50% reduction in infection, not disease, but infection. So, <clears throat> condom error is a problem. You have to know how to use them properly. 60% of men didn't discuss using condoms with their partners. So if we talk about this, we say, well, you really need to be prepared about it before and actually think about when would you actually put the condom on and when would you have this discussion? 42% wanted to use a condom but did not have any available. 43% put condoms on after starting sex. Not a great idea. <laughs> but if you're brought up to believe that sex is wrong, somehow we say, well, if you're going to commit a sin, it's better to commit a sin of passion than to have one that's thought out, right? We think about, we equate sex and murder. So we all say, well, if he thought about murdering someone, that person you lock up for life. But if they didn't think about it, it's a crime of passion, well, that we're willing to forgive a little bit more. Ask Buddy, whatever his name was, the governor of Mississippi. Um, and we said, well, sex is a lot like murder, apparently, because we say from a lot of our conservative groups that if you just happen to have sex but you really weren't planning for it, well, that's forgivable. But if you plan for it, you can't then say, well, I made a mistake. So as a result, there's a no talk, no discussion policy. There's no plan for it. And of course, then what you have is you start having sex and you think, well, maybe I should do something about it because it's just sort of happened. You got to plan these things and think about using it. 15% remove the condom before ending sex. Now, if it's a semen catcher, and I know when most men stop having sex, it's not usually before they ejaculate, right? <clears throat> and we're not going to actually see how long that takes. 40% didn't provide any space at the tip, so they have a blowout. So if you put a condom on, you got to pinch the tip, roll it down, so you allow a little bit of room. There's a reservoir at the top of the condom so that, again, semen can go there. I, I apologize that this is overly graphic for folks, but this is what I do for a living. Wrong idea to put it on and realize that the roll is on the inside. Not particularly pleasant for guys to have the roll of the latex inside. Turning it over is a really bad idea. So if we talk about like what's inside the condom and then you're going to flip it over and put it back on, not good. Why? Because the condom goes on what? Is it a flaccid penis or an erect penis? If you're going to put it on, you hope for it to stay on, you put it on an erect penis. Which means that, one, there may be some pre-ejaculate that gets inside the condom. We know that there can be other STDs in pre-ejaculate. But it also came in contact with the skin. So syphilis, herpes, HPV are all transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact. If any of those pathogens are on the skin, on the inside of the condom, you flip it over, you just sort of have now, probably better than not wearing it at all again, but certainly it increases the risk. And then 32% reported losing the condom. It happens. I can tell you, I've, I've had 
people come into the clinic and what you know you be got to go searching for things which reminds me I, I was working in the clinic and I had one of my nurses come up and she said uh, I just had a woman who came in and she said she had a vaginal discharge and I go do the exam and I look and there's something in the back of the vaginal vault so I get a swab and pull it out and it's a rolled up five dollar bill And, right, that would have been my, I was sort of like, okay, I got to hear this one. And, uh, and she, so she pulls the thing out, and the woman goes, and she said, well, there must be some reason why. She said, oh, well, you know, I was having this contest with another one of my female friends about who could put more money in their vagina. And, <laughs> which is not something, you know, look, I'm a guy, but I generally don't think about like, hey, why don't I see how many I can fit in this orifice? It's not something that usually... And, and she obviously didn't count well because I suspect that they probably had a few too many drinks and it's important to count your change because she left the $5 bill in. So we've had people come in and, you know, the condom is like there. And that could be rectum, vagina. Most people don't lose it in their mouth, so... Um, uh, but... But the other dirty little secret is that erection thing sort of came off there, uh, is that a lot of guys don't like latex condoms because latex condoms have an inverse effect. They squeeze. Well, you maintain an erection by blood being in the penis. If you put force on the penis, you can force blood out. So part of the problem you get into is some guys don't like using condoms because it actually causes them to lose their erection. Now, you can overcome that, obviously, with pharmaceuticals. We can also use what? Well, we're not going to talk about cock ring, so we'll just skip right past that. You can use plastic condoms. So there are condoms that are not latex that actually work very well that a lot of people feel is better in terms of sensitivity and doesn't cause problems around maintaining erections. My point is you really need to think about this and make sure that this becomes part of having sex, that you have fun doing that, that you make sure you're prepared for it, you know how to use it, you've had negotiations around that, and you know how to use it properly. And then condom errors, again, for women, we can see younger age, primary partner, lack of partner support. We don't see that so much for male-female relationships, but when the primary partner is there, I can tell you we hear this a lot. I use condoms with my non-primary partner, but my primary partner, I never use condoms. What's wrong with that assumption? well, your primary partner isn't having sex with someone else, right? And then we get into this whole thing, well, if I use a condom with my primary partner, they're assuming that I had sex with someone else. So you get in this circular thing. Let's get beyond that. Have a discussion up front. You got to protect yourself. So both men and women in this group, I want you to protect yourself. And then the last part here is in predictors of adolescent condom use, perception of risk with STDs with the main partner. They underestimate that. The odds that condoms are used with the main partner significantly lower among those who use hormonal contraception. We talked about pregnancy. Strong implementation intention. So if you don't really think about using it beforehand and plan on using it, you won't. Binge drinking, lower use. And then the last part here, partners with less desire for emotional intimacy were more likely to get, away, get their way about condom use. So the person who says, well, hey, you're going to use a condom, I'm not having sex, is the person who's more likely to have the way on that. And I would again say, value yourself enough to say, look, if that's how you feel about it, see ya. And then the predictors are all here, and for the sake of time, I'm going to go on to the last couple of slides here. There is no data to support that providing condoms increases sex among adolescents. So the idea that we shouldn't make condoms available in high schools or college campuses because we're only going to increase promiscuity doesn't bear out in terms of our data. And if we look at around sex education and policies, again, you can look this up, you'll have the slides, that in those areas in which they have very progressive sex education, the STD rates aren't higher. In fact, they may be lower. So sex and STI prevention. Like politics, all sex is local. Our STI inequities are not about sex alone. It's about everything else along with it. Ultimately, sexual health is a right-based right -based issue, and we really need to develop programs that will address all the contextual factors that we talked about and move into partnerships with the community in addressing those things. 
I'm not going to read this for the sake of time. You can read it. But the bottom line is it's talking about sexual health. And really, only the first sentence actually describes what sexual health is. The rest really talks about the conditions that are necessary for sexual health. So in finishing, <clears throat> I view sex as a gateway to being an adult. It's not like you're going to all of a sudden become an adult and then have sex. It's an exploration and a journey. And it will be there for you, hopefully, for the rest of your life. And I want you to have good, healthy sex, and that means having discussions at an early age. And we've got about three minutes, I think, for questions. I think that's about it. That is about I'm it. I'm I'm most, there is another class after this. I mostly want to thank you. You covered a lot of cards. Thank you. Thank you.